Okay, good morning, guys. Looking forward to the session. Let's. We can't. We can't start this briefing anywhere else other than this uh, chart I've got in front of you here. Let's make this a lot bigger. This is a long-term chart of the price of crude oil. It's a it's a crude oil story. It's a commodity story more broadly. And this, as I said, this is a monthly chart. We're going right the way back to the crisis here, and indeed the the pre-crisis, just extraordinary. You know, the most extraordinary period, really, in the history of crude oil prices, I would say. That run into 2008 and the spike up to 100 bucks and hitting 146, and the crisis, financial crisis, global recession hits, and the, the collapse that took us down to 33.50 or 33.55, the credit crunch low. It is quite remarkable that we are now looking here and thinking, well, hang on. We're pretty much here. We're, we're going to test the credit crunch low, aren't we? Or, or are we? We'll see. But that credit crunch low, you know, anything below that, and you've got to go back to 2004. Um, so I wanted to just bring this screenshot into play to begin the briefing, just to show you where things stand on the ultra long term. You know, now that we're down, testing the low of 2015 and really, well, officially making a new low for the year. So we made a new eight-year low yesterday. Uh, sorry, six-year low yesterday. And, you know, the the credit crunch low is the next level. There's nothing. There's nothing between here and, and the credit crunch low. But the credit crunch low is, is at 33.55. So that's another $4 or so. Which doesn't sound like much, four bucks, given some of the movements we've had in recent times. Four bucks seems pretty tame. But that's obviously now that price is down here. That's another more than ten percent. Obviously, um, that's a that's a that's a more than a ten percent move that is required to get us down to test the, the two thousand and nine low. Let's just zoom in a bit on a daily chart. Because you can see what happened yesterday, big move to the downside, and we took out and closed below the August lows. This is on a continuation chart. So the August 24th low, you know, in amongst that that panic over China, uh, we hit 37.75. So we broke that. We are trading back above it now, um, as it stands this morning. So crude is up half a percent, but really we're, we're just kind of um, chopping around at the very bottom of yesterday's. 5.8% sell-off as we took out the $40 handle in style. And, um, and if we zoom in a bit more, let's go to like a two-hour chart just to track through the last sort of week or so. And, you know, of course, it was all mainly about Friday's um, decision or, well, can't really call it decision, uh, Friday's lack of decision from OPEC that has set this up, of course. And whilst Friday we got down and we tested 40 bucks, we tested the low from the week before. It was a bit messy. Um, it wasn't until the get-go, the Asian session for this week, that we really broke $40 and, uh, properly. And, and ever since then, the whole session yesterday was, was very negative. And all we're doing now is consolidating um, this big sell-off. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's continued fallout from the OPEC meeting. I think it's just, you know, the the... The, the more time we had to digest it over the weekend, the more obvious it was that the relationships uh, within OPEC are at their worst levels. I don't know. I mean, certainly since I've been trading for 15 years or so, I, don't, I can't ever remember OPEC being, you know, the, the relationships being so fractious. Um, you, you've got to, you know, I, I was talking about this last week, kind of, half jokingly but actually half serious you know are we seeing the beginning of the end of OPEC here you know it, it has it got to the point where these relationships are permanently damaged have they now lost their ability to work as a as a unit in an effort to manipulate and control oil prices because that's what they've been doing for 40 years um, it's just that actually it looks like that uh, ability to work together is gone. And so what we have, and if we just look at a chart here of uh, OPEC output growth year on year, this is going back um, over the last two years, and just looking at how 
output has changed. And looking at the two biggest OPEC members, which is Saudi Arabia and Iraq, and, and you can see that every single month, bar one or two, well, certainly for Iraq, I guess, through the second half of 2014, we saw, oh, sorry, not Iraq, for Saudi Arabia through the second half of, or the mid part of 2014, we saw Saudi's year-on-year -year output drop um, for about six consecutive months. Um, but but apart from that little period there, and certainly if you look at Iraq, the sort of orange yellowy bars, then every single month for two years, they've increased output. But the point about this chart is look at, look at 2015. As we've gone into 2015, when don't forget, at the start of 2015, prices were already you know, right down towards 50 bucks. And yet every month, we've seen increases in output from the two biggest members of OPEC and not small increases. This has taken Saudi Arabia and Iraq to record ever output levels. So when we went into the meeting at the end of last week, you know, you've got OPEC pumping 32 million barrels a day. That's two bit, sorry, 32 million barrels a day. That's two million above their official ceiling. And then you have a meeting where you've got half of the table, you know, their economies are just getting killed off this. You know, the likes of the Venezuelans, for example, and the Nigerians, you know, Venezuela tabled um, a proposal to cut production by 5%. It was just, it was just laughed out of the room. And so you've got half of the people around the table in so much fiscal pain that they're, they're getting, they're beginning to become desperate. And then you've got the other half of the table who are stubbornly entrenched in their view that we've got to keep price low. We've got to win back our market share. It doesn't matter how much pain in the short term it takes. We're sticking to our guns. Then you've got Iran saying, well, hang on a minute. You know, it's only fair that when sanctions get lifted, it's only fair that, that we're allowed to see our output right because we've been penalized because of sanctions for years. It's only fair for us to increase output. But guys, Saudi Arabia and Iraq, you've got to reduce output accordingly. Look, Iran are saying, Saudi and Iraq, you've been increasing output all year. When our sanctions get lifted, you guys need to reduce output whilst we raise. Now, of course, the relationship between Saudi and Iran um, is the opposite to, to positive. And so, you know, the idea of Saudi Arabia are going to say, yeah, sure, Iran, fine. You, know, you, uh, you increase production, we'll reduce production to your benefit and our... Um, and, and, and that'll be negative to us. That, that's just nonsense, right? So Saudi are only prepared. The only way that we're going to get an OPEC, an, an OPEC production cut is if Saudi Arabia decide to cut production. The only way Saudi Arabia are going to cut production is if Iraq and Iran, and actually way more significantly, Russia, agree to cut production as well. Now, the thing about this is when you, when you think about Russia, they're desperately increasing output because prices are so low and fiscally they're having real trouble. Uh, and what they're doing is increasing output to try and sell more oil at a cheaper price rather than thinking about this more strategically and saying, well, actually, perhaps we should try and sell less oil at a higher price. Um, but as it stands at the moment, you've got Russia, Saudi Arabia, and let's just bring in the U.S. as well. They're the three biggest producers, and they're all producing at record ever levels of output. And what does this add up to in a, in a world that has a globally weak economy? It adds up to a surplus. Right now, developed economies, and this is just developed economies, have stockpiles that add up to three billion barrels of crude oil. So... We've got an oversupply, we've got a, a terrible oversupply problem already, and it's just got worse as the year's gone on. And now we've had the OPEC meeting, and, and they, OPEC can't decide to do anything. They're, they're literally, they couldn't even decide on whether to keep an official output ceiling or not. And in the end, all they had to do was just announce that we're just going to keep things as they are. And that was the only level of detail they were prepared to give because that was the only, that's because they didn't decide on anything. So you've got this situation where output is continuing to rise 
into a market that's already phenomenally oversupplied and as it stands if things stay the same on the output side the only way this price goes up is if demand expectations improve so it falls back onto the economic situation in this world and as it stands that that is still fairly fragile so how low can this go is the question back to the monthly chart oh sorry hang on let me go back to the monthly chart how low can the price of oil go um it's a it's a it's a bit of a lottery that game trying to predict where this thing might stop but i would say that there's a there's a real chance we'll get a test of the credit crunch low if we do i i just cannot see oil staying that low for very long we might break it that the credit crunch low we might get some kind of technical breach that might just flick us down to 30 bucks very, very briefly. But I don't think the price of oil, I, I think this would be irrationally low. And you've got to start to think about the long term supply situation here, which is completely not factored into this market at all. You know, the fact that the capital expenditure levels in the oil industry have been absolutely annihilated over the last 12 months means that future oil supply is at significant risk. You know, the lower this goes, then maybe we will see the beginnings of the shale oil industry in the U.S., you know, get to the get to breaking point. Maybe it will force Russia and Saudi Arabia to come together and say, you know what, I know we engineered this problem ourselves, but you know we've actually failed our policy at some point how do you got to say our policies failed we try to lower price to squeeze out the shale producers they've won the US is still pumping oil at 9.2 million barrels a day they've been more resilient than than we thought possible um, fair enough you know this is hurting us more than them we're gonna have to change policy that might come at $30 and when it does come that's your dramatic reversal that might see oil get back up to 50. Don't think oil's going to go back to 100. But from a percentage trade, you know, that's huge. That's like a 60% trade. If, if, if oil goes from 30 to 50 bucks, um, then that's a 66% trade that could well happen over the course of, let's say, a month or two. But we're going to have a breaking point here. There's got to be a breaking point here, whether it's Saudi and Russia agreeing to uh, a coordinated production cut, um, whether it's the shale industry uh, and the U.S. oil output dropping below 9 million barrels, whether it's a continuation of this collapse in capex in the oil industry more generally, um, well, and, and, the, and the least powerful and the least likely would be a dramatic improvement in global growth prospects and a dramatic improvement in global demand. But any one of these things, if not, if not several of these things together, will, will bring an end to this rout. And it might be that it takes a test of the credit crunch low before then we get these events. So I think we can get to the credit crunch low. I think maybe we might briefly dip below it, but I would. I would call a bottom there. There we go. I've said it. Right. It's not just about oil, though, because we've got a commodity space that's been killed as well. Um, iron ore hitting credit crunch lows yesterday. Um, the commodity complex, um, if you look at the commodity index, it's at a 16-year low. It's, it's extraordinary. And what's not helping, of course, is the dollar. You know, so let me go to a uh, let's go to a weekly chart here on euro dollar because obviously the dollar weakened or no, it didn't. the euro strengthened last week, um, which banks. But look, the dollar is still very very strong, and if you look at the dollar index, it's at multi year highs, right? So for commodities, this is a like a triple whammy. You've got an oversupply, you've got weak demand prospects, and you've got a strong dollar all at the same time. Now, there's a school of thought here that's saying, wow, hang on, the U.S. are about to start their rate hiking cycle. The dollar is going to continue to strengthen. This is going to continue to put downward pressure on the commodity complex. However, that could well be an incorrect thought process if 
if you look back at previous US rate hiking cycles, um, on the last six rate hiking cycles, if you go back, this is going back over several decades, <clears throat> then actually the dollar has rallied into the beginning of the cycle. And actually, on average, the dollar peaks three weeks before the first hike. And what happens when the cycle actually begins? Well, then the dollar weakens. If this rate hiking cycle bears any kind of similarity to previous ones, then we might actually see the end of the dollar rally at the end of this year when the Fed start hiking. However, that is a massive if, because can you really say that this rate hiking cycle is going to be similar to others? And I mean, I think if you did say that, then I think that would be an error as well. Um, every single other rate hiking cycle in the last 50 years has been in conjunction with increasing global growth and what we have at the moment is decreasing global growth also never before have we had such well so much monetary policy but also never before have we had such a dramatic monetary policy divergence so is it possible for the dollar to weaken in 2016 as the fed hikes rates when actually other central banks are delivering policy to purposely weaken their own currency so I don't think you can, by any means, assume this rate hiking cycle is going to be anything like the others. However, if it does bear some similarity, then the dollar rally might be in its very final stages. Also, if you think about growth, you know, maybe there's a chance growth can pick up in 2016. So from the commodity complex point of view, there, there, is, a, there is a way to see the commodity sell-off bottoming out at the end of this year and starting to recover or at least stabilize before recovering in 2016. But there's a lot of risks to that. Um, how's this impacting on, the, on bond prices? This is the Bund. And just before I talk about the Bund, just be, I mean, talk about its price movement here, just be aware that we've rolled over. So we're trading January here, we're charting January here. This is the January 2016 Bund futures contract. Um, if you looked at a continuation chart, then we've rolled over today on this chart. So this is actually the continuation chart, um, which is tracking the December contract as we sold off during Draghi's ECB day last week. And then the December contract yesterday rebounding, that's December 15. Now we gap up to the beginning of this chart, charting the, Jan the March 20. 16. Okay, so um, there is a there is a level. It's quite interesting this technically. And it's always very difficult when you're getting rollover to know what to do with your technical levels because on the left hand chart here I've got just the January contract, whereas uh, on on the right here I've got the continuation chart. But actually it coincides in that the December contract high from last week in fact the double top at 158.75 and then also the ecb day high was at 158.63 so these are the levels actually that the january contract has topped out at this morning okay and just be aware of these december contract levels which seem to have done a job this morning with the january contract hopefully i haven't confused you there but it is always tricky when you get a rollover but Here's just the January contract with the January contract sell off last week and a 50% fib is where we're basically trading at now when you're looking at the range from last week's high down to um, Friday's low. But the thing about the rally yesterday in the boom, this was all about the commodity space. This was commodities selling off leading to future inflation expectations dropping. I mentioned this in the briefing yesterday morning. After a bit of confusion in my own head, I finally um, got to the point that if oil does sell off today, then you're most likely going to see long duration bond yields drop as inflation expectations get lowered. And this means long duration bond prices go up. And that's what happened yesterday. This was all about the commodity collapse, really bringing, bringing home the very real prospect that Inflation's going to stay low for longer. Because look, let me bring in the oil chart again. 
is a really important point for 2016, sorry, it's a really important point for future monetary policy. Because if we, let me just go to a weekly chart. If you think about oil into 2016, you know, if it does, if it does stay here, I mean, if, who, who the hell knows, right? But let's assume, just bear, you know, go with me here. Let's assume oil stays uh, around where we are now, $37 through next year. Well, then every month through next year, oil will have a very sharp negative effect on the inflation basket, especially when you go into April, May, and June, um, where oil was up at $60. And, you know, so the negative effect on the inflation basket will continue throughout 2016 if and only if the price stays down at these levels, of course. If we bounce back up to 50 bucks, well then sure, oil will not have a negative effect on the inflation basket. But the point is, how is this going to influence monetary policy? What does Draghi do? What does Draghi do into 2016 with the prospect that inflation is going to stay right, well, at zero and below, you know, continue to be way, way, way below their target. What do they do? Because the problem they have is their monetary policy decisions have no effect on the price of oil. But the price of oil does have a very large effect on inflation, which they're trying to control. So what are they supposed to do in, in the meantime? Do they act and, and do they have a monetary policy that's shaped by oil prices? If they do, then I would suggest that's a dangerous path to go down because as soon as, you know, at some point oil is going to rise and if it rises sharply, then these central banks are going to be way behind the curve and going to have to hike rates very rapidly, which is going to create economic turmoil. So they've got a real problem. If oil stays at these prices into 2016, these central banks, they've got a big problem in front of them. Anyway, that's a problem for next year. Uh, let's talk about today, and let's just talk about equities as well. I haven't touched on equities yet. Equities were pretty resilient, all things considered, to this oil price move yesterday. We did get downward movement in the S&P throughout the afternoon, but a decent bounce into the close meant that a lot of that damage was, was given back. Uh, sorry, it was recovered. This morning, we're just chopping around. I think you've got to look at daily charts here. And it does look like we're still getting this rounded top um, on the S&P chart, up around the trend line for 2015, this rounded top. But I've got this upward trend line here that we kind of tested last week and we did break it, but in the end it was a false break. So maybe, you know, if we get downside pressure today and a break of this trend line, then that might just open us up to a move down towards 2000. Um, but, you know, at the moment, there's I'd say this oil price collapse yesterday, if it continues today, and at the moment it hasn't, we're just stabilized. But if there is more downside, I do expect it to have more of a notably negative effect on equity prices, especially those indexes, obviously, that are um, heavyweight uh, commodities and energy stocks. So. Uh, yeah, just a couple of comments, just whilst I was talking about oil, just a couple of comments from Reuters. Um, so Indonesian OPEC governor has been talking, and of course they're now part of OPEC as of last week. And Indonesia is saying they won't support any OPEC policy that aims to raise global oil prices. <laughs> Great. So <laughs> there we are. And OPEC, apparently according to the Indonesians, OPEC should hold emergency meeting if oil falls to $30 a barrel. There you go then. So they're kind of thinking along my lines. But they're saying they're not going to support policy that to cut production, except $30 seems to be a line in the sand, which I think is right. So we'll see. We're not at $30, but we might be at this rate pretty soon. Um, we'll see. I think the important price isn't $30. I think it's that credit crunch low at $33.50. Uh, right, let's just look at the daily calendar. We've had some data overnight as well, just to kind of very quickly bring you up to speed. Chinese export and import numbers. Um, the, the, the story continues. So there's nothing new here. This is the story of 2015. This is where export price uh, exports have dropped. We've had five negative months in a row now on a year-on-year -year basis. This is 
five negative months in a row, if I go to a five-year chart, so perhaps put things in a better light, because exports are pretty volatile, as you can see, and this is mainly due to the kind of lunar New Year holiday at the start of each um, calendar year in China. Um, but what we've seen is, of course, a steadily trending, upward trending export situation, except this year it's not. So, I mean, this is really the end of China's sort of emerging market industrialization growth story, which was inevitable. Um, but we have got five year-on-year -year prints that are negative in a row. That means that exports in November 2015 were quite a bit less um, than exports in November 2014. Okay. If you have a look at the imports chart, so actually the exports number last night was more negative than expected. The imports chart is pretty much exactly the same. Um, when you look at a, so let me just get this chart. flat on the year and it kind of has but the point is that it's flat at a lower level than we were last year and indeed a lower level than we were in 2013 and in fact 2014 2015 imports are basically on average lower than even in 2011 you've got you basically got to go back to 2010 to find a year where Chinese imports were better oh sorry were lower than what we've had this year so again this tells two stories doesn't it it tells the story of a globally weak economy, and it tells the story of an internally weak economy. Um, and of course, both of these factors are contributing to that nightmare that's happening in the commodity space. So this is the data from overnight. Just very briefly, Japan delivered a GDP print that saw them revise their GDP out of negative territory. They were technically in a recession, quarter two and three this year. Again, that is, you can see this pattern repeating Quarter two and three last year were recession. Quarter two and three this year were recession until now, where they revised up their quarter three number back into positive territory. So remember, a recession is technically two negative quarters in a row. So Japan, I mean, it's all pretty academic, but um, avoiding recession. Um, let's just look at today's calendar and what's left of it. We still have, generally this week, it's quiet. It was such a, a phenomenal week last week. So we've had all this Japanese stuff. We've had some French data this morning. Really, the next the next numbers on the slate will be out of the UK, where we've got industrial and manufacturing production. Industrial produ production is expected at plus 0.1 month on month, plus 1.2 year on year. Manufacturing production is expected to turn negative on the month and flat on the year. We get the the another update. This is a revision on quarter three GDP. I can't remember, I think this is just the second preliminary GDP reading for quarter three. The first one was delivered a month ago, where they told us that growth in the Eurozone was at plus 0.3% on a quarter on quarter basis. It's expected to be unchanged. This is most likely not going to be a data point that's going to have any effect, even though it's on, in bold on this calendar. Um, unless it is different, which is probably not likely, it's expected to be at plus 0.3% as last time, in which case it will not carry any market impact. Just going through the rest, not much else, to be honest, into the US session. And we've got stuff like JOLTS, Jolt's job openings numbers and the IBD tip economic optimism survey, um, which are fine and interesting. But, you know, look at these job, job, JOLTS job openings is, is October data here. You know, we had November payrolls on Friday. So this stuff becomes less significant although the fed do for some reason do like to look at this number as well but it is old um and that's it we've gone past the fed speak so fed speaks off the off the agenda now that's it they're into their blackout and we wait to hear from the fed next time will be a week on thursday when we do, when we hear that they hike rates um so forget about fed speakers from now on we had bullard was the final one yesterday so we get Constancio and McCutch from the ECB today. But again, they made their move or not last week. So, you know, how much more can be said from these guys at this point? I'm not so sure. So the data calendar is, I'm afraid, pretty empty again. And so really, we just continue to, the markets are being dominated by what's going on in the commodity space. And I think we'll continue to do so. If oil can bounce today, 
well, sure, that's going to have an effect. Bunds will sell off. If, if, but if oil breaks yesterday's low, which don't forget is basically the August low. If I just go back to the daily chart just to finish the briefing. This August level still important, 37.75. You know, any movement below yesterday's low, and that's going to spill into all other assets, okay? Negative for equities, negative, uh, sorry, positive for long duration bonds. You know, as you get that yield curve in the US flattening. Um, so we shall see interesting times, people. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the day.